Hey, I'm Daniel and by now it should be no surprise that I absolutely love crazy infrastructure and American freight trains. And in some of the last videos we already saw a lot of amazing shots of this combination. From trains running right in front of the skyline along the Ohio River in Pittsburgh, to massive yards and coal unloading facilities in Norfolk. All of these places are connected by endless miles of tracks through mountain canyons, across rivers and straight through the cities themselves. At some point you look at these alignments and just wonder, who designed this? Why is it built this way? And why is everything so over-engineered? So in this video I want to show you a few locations with some of the most spectacular rail infrastructure in the country. Places that might make you love these trains as much as I do. From a major junction next to a historic steel plant, to a single train crossing itself on a loop, to one of the only triple level rail crossings in the world and a giant 180 degree curve that's been carrying freight for more than a century. Let's explore America's wildest rail infrastructure. Our first stop on the list leads us to Pennsylvania, just southeast of Pittsburgh, at Port Perry, a location where several key freight lines come together in a very limited amount of space. This segment was originally built by the Pennsylvania Railroad as a bypass around downtown Pittsburgh, avoiding the restrictive tunnels and steep approaches closer to the city. Today it remains an important Norfolk Southern Corridor for double-stack trains, mixed freight and rail traffic serving the local steel industry. What immediately stands out is how tightly everything is arranged. The Port Perry Bridge crosses the Monongahela River. And right after the bridge, the tracks split toward the Pittsburgh Line, the Mon Line and multiple industrial leads feeding into nearby facilities. On the other side sits the US Steel Edgar Thompson Works, operating since the 1870s. Its own railway, the Union Railroad, moves raw materials and finished steel around the plant and to interchange points with Norfolk Southern. Because these transfers happen constantly, the area includes short sidings, crossovers and switching points positioned very close together. And this is also a place where you understand why Pittsburgh is called the city of bridges, with more than a dozen of them at this single place. The river on one side, steep hills on the other and a steel mill taking up nearly all flat ground leave almost no room for surface routes. So the railroads rely on bridges, tight approaches and compact junctions to move freight through a corridor that simply doesn't have space to spare. Our next location takes us to northeastern California, on the former Western Pacific route through the Seria, Nevada, today operated by Union Pacific. Here, near the small community of Spring Garden, the railroad built one of the most distinctive pieces of track geometry on the entire transcontinental network, the Williams Loop. This loop was constructed in the early 1910s as part of the Feather River route, a line designed with a very specific goal, keeping the maximum grade at roughly 1%. That low gradient made the route longer but allowed heavy freight trains to cross the mountains without excessive helper power or steep climbing sections. And oh man, does this look fucking epic. Definitely check out Railfan Dan, cool name by the way, for more of this kind of stuff. So back to the Williams Loop. To maintain this gentle climb in the terrain west of the Feather River Canyon, engineers created a complete loop where the track turns almost 300 360 degrees and crosses over itself. It's not as tight or dramatic as the Tehachapi loop but with much prettier scenery and the purpose is similar. Extend the distance so the train can gain elevation gradually. From above you can clearly see the alignment. A long sweeping curve that wraps around a hillside then passes beneath its own bridge before continuing up the grade. Freight trains can stretch across the loop all at once with head and power mid-train locomotives and distributed power on the rear all visible at the same time.
Our third stop on the list takes us to Richmond, Virginia, home to one of the rarest railway configurations in the world, the Triple Crossing. In most cities it's already unusual to see two rail lines crossing each other, but in Richmond three different railroads pass over the same point on three separate levels. Simply fascinating stuff, right? The lowest level sits right along the James River Park. Originally built by the Southern Railway, this line stays close to the water to avoid steep grades in and out of the city. Above it, the middle level carries one of CSX's main east-west roads, crossing on a timber and steel structure built in the late 1800s and upgraded many times since. And the highest level is a tall steel viaduct used also by CSX, allowing its trains to bypass the busy city center without interfering with the movements below. Each level was built by a different railroad at a different point in time. None of them wanted to share tracks or give up their preferred routes, and the geography around downtown Richmond left very few options. So over the years, the lines were simply stacked vertically, one above the other, to keep all three companies flowing through the same corridor. What makes the triple crossing especially interesting is not just its rarity, but the fact that it's still fully operational. Freight trains, Amtrak passenger services and local movements all use these routes daily, and each level plays a different role in the network. Unlike many historical structures that have been abandoned or repurposed, this one continues continues to function exactly as intended, allowing multiple railroads to move through tight urban space without slowing each other down. Our final stop today takes us to Altoona, Pennsylvania, home to one of the most famous pieces of railroad engineering in the United States, the Horseshoe Curve. Completed in 1854 by the Pennsylvania Railroad, the goal was straightforward, but extremely challenging. Create a route that could move heavy trains across the Allegheny Mountains without using steep grades or slow, complicated incline systems. Instead of climbing straight up, engineers designed a massive 100 80 degree curve that wraps around the hillside, extending the distance just enough to keep the grade manageable. The design was simple in principle but difficult to build. More than 400 workers carved the alignment into the slope, using basic tools, laying out a curve wide enough for long freight trains while maintaining a grade of just under 1.8%. It became the key link that allowed the Pennsylvania Railroad to move coal, steel and manufactured goods between the Midwest and the East Coast. Today, the curve remains the central park of Norfolk Southern East-West Main Line. Because of the steady climb toward the Gallatin Summit, locomotives are often added at the rear for additional power, especially on heavier consists. The layout itself hasn't changed much. The curvature, the grade and the overall footprint remain almost exactly as they were originally engineered, which shows how well the original design matched the needs of the heavy freight operations. Modern Signaling and higher capacity infrastructure have been added, but the basic geometry still does the job. So these were four examples how American freight railroads deal with difficult terrain, limited space and huge trains every single day. From the tight industrial corridor at Port Perry, to the long gentle climb of Williams Loop, to the stack tracks of the Richmond Triple Crossing and the historic mountain alignment at Horseshoe Curve. Each of them solves a completely different challenge, but all of them keep the same network moving.